For the first time, Americans today are not free to say what they think. If they say something deemed offensive or insensitive or, worst of all, hate speech, they may be in serious trouble. They may be punished for violating the unholy commandments of the 90s, commonly known as political correctness. But is political correctness a new phenomenon? We'll show you tonight that political correctness has been in the making for more than eight decades. And it seems that a deteriorating society is exactly what political correctness strives for. But just what is political correctness? As you're about to see, political correctness is nothing less than a Marxist ideology. Marxism translated from economic into cultural terms in an effort going back not to the 1960s, but to World War I. Marxist theory had predicted that if war came to Europe, the working class in every European country would rise in revolt. But that theory proved wrong. When the First World War began in 1914, the workers' loyalty to their country proved stronger than their so-called class consciousness. They willingly put on their uniforms, French or German, Austrian or Russian or British, and marched off by the millions to fight each other. In 1917, a Marxist revolution did occur in Russia, but it failed to spread to Western Europe, again contradicting orthodox Marxist theory. At the war's end, Marxist theorists had to confront the question, what had gone wrong? Antonio Gramsci in Italy and Georg Lukács in Hungary believed they had the answer. Gramsci and Lukács argued that Western culture had blinded the working class to its true Marxist class interests. Before a Marxist revolution could take place, Western culture had to be destroyed. In 1919, Lukács, who was considered the most brilliant Marxist theorist since Marx himself, asked, who will save us from Western civilization? That same year, 1919, Lukács became deputy commissar for culture in the Bolshevik Belakun government in Hungary, where he launched a program of cultural terrorism. As part of that program, Lukács introduced a radical sex education program into the Hungarian schools. Political correctness, as we know it, was already beginning to take form. He tried to actually undermine the unity of the family, and that was one of the reasons that he tried to introduce sex education. Laszlo Pastor, a leader in the Hungarian resistance against the communist takeover of Hungary after World War II, explains why children were targeted. It's always much tougher to convert an adult, you know, to do something what he was taught not to do. The program left great residual effects on Hungary. The only thing what we were permitted to accept as far as culture is concerned, what they were teaching, that was it. Free thinking was a very big sin. The Belakun government lasted only a few months, in part, because the Hungarian working class was outraged by Georg Lukács' assault on traditional Western culture. But meanwhile, in Germany, a new attempt to create a Marxist critique of Western culture was taking shape. There, the wealthy young son of a millionaire grain trader, Felix Weil, wanted to establish a public policy institute, a think tank, to serve as a home for advanced Marxist thought. Model on the Marx-Engels Institute in Moscow, Weil's think tank was originally to be named the Institute for Marxism. Martin Jay, chairman of the history department at Berkeley, an author of a history of the Frankfurt School, explains why the name was changed to the Institute for Sozialforschung, the Institute for Social Research. But I think they were very interested in trying to avoid being overly labeled. Uh, so it's a fairly bland name, the Institute of Social Research. The Institute was affiliated with Frankfurt University in Frankfurt, Germany, and in time became known simply as the Frankfurt School. The Frankfurt School formally opened its doors on June 22, 1924, but it had already held its first seminar on theory in the spring of 1923. There, almost two dozen Marxist scholars gathered for what Weil, the sponsor, called a Marxist study week. One of the participants was Richard Sorge, later a famous Soviet spy. Another was Georg Lukács. Lukács's writings on culture were the basis for much of the program. Almost half of the participants in this Marxist study week 
would later be affiliated with the Frankfurt School. Following Lukács' lead, the Frankfurt School would be the vehicle that translated Marxism from economic into cultural terms, giving us what we now know as political correctness. The Frankfurt School's first director was an Austrian Marxist economist, Karl Greenberg. Greenberg's principal effort was to firmly establish the Institute's Marxist nature. In his inaugural address, which opened the Institute's new building in Frankfurt, Greenberg said, It has been our intention here from the outset to maintain uniformity in the way we look at problems and go about solving them. I too am one of the opponents of the economic, social and legal order which has been handed down to us from history and I too am one of the supporters of Marxism. In the new research institute, Marxism will from now on have a home. Under Karl Greenberg, the Frankfurt School worked mostly on economic questions and the labor movement, conventional Marxist subjects. But in 1930, Greenberg was replaced as director by a young Marxist intellectual with very different ideas, Max Horkheimer. Horkheimer quickly began to use the institute to develop a new Marxism, very different from the Marxism of the Soviet Union. First, recognizing the economic success of capitalism, Horkheimer announced that revolution was unlikely to come from the working class. The Frankfurt School would have to find a substitute. Well, this was the great question. The, the great question is, is there a surrogate for the working class? The Frankfurt School would not find an answer to this question until the 1960s. But meanwhile, Horkheimer moved to revive Lukács' work by making the culture, not the economy, the central focus of the Frankfurt School's work. As Martin J. writes in his history of the Frankfurt School, The Dialectical Imagination, if it can be said that in the early years of its history, the Institute concerned itself primarily with an analysis of bourgeois society's socioeconomic substructure, in the years after 1930, its prime interest lay in its cultural superstructure. Indeed, the traditional Marxist formula regarding the relationship between the two was called into question. The key to the Frankfurt School's work on culture was the crossing of Marx with Freud. Just as classical economic Marxism argued that under capitalism, the working class was oppressed, so the Frankfurt School used Freud to argue that under Western culture, everyone lived in a constant state of psychological repression. So there were radical Freudians during this period who had hopes of using psychoanalysis to uh, end what Reich had called sexual alienation, uh, which they saw as, as significant as economic alienation. The solution, according to the Frankfurt School, was not just a political revolution to overthrow capitalism, but a social and cultural revolution as well. To further the Institute's work on cultural issues, Horkheimer brought in some new blood. New members included a sometime music critic, Theodore Adorno. Martin Jay sees this edition as critical. Well, Adorno is perhaps the most uh, fecund and uh, I think um, uh, brilliant of all the members of the Frankfurt School. Another new member was Eric Fromm. Fromm, a practicing psychoanalyst, was noted for his radical Marxist social psychology. He pioneered the concept of sexual liberation and gender politics. According to Martin Jay, in Fromm's view, masculinity and femininity were not reflections of essential sexual differences. They were derived instead from differences in life functions, which were in part socially determined. Another piece of political correctness was falling into place. In 1932, Herbert Marcuse became a member of the Institute for Social Research. Marcuse would ultimately become the most important member of the Frankfurt School for the development of political correctness. In the 1950s and 60s, Marcuse would complete the translation of Marxism into cultural terms and inject it into the new left. Martin Jay sums it up. Uh, in which Marcuse in the United States represented the most radical uh, inclinations of the school, uh, in a sense continuing the work they had done in the 1920s and uh, into the 30s, uh, a work that was um, inspired by Marxist Hegelian philosophy, were interested in uh, the crisis both of capitalism and liberal democracy, trying to find uh, alternatives to the working class. As we've seen, the Frankfurt School, Marxist in origin, 
wanted to create a cultural revolution against Western society. And in the 1930s, they took their important first step. In the 1930s, the work of Horkheimer, Adorno, Fromm, and Marcuse issued in its first tangible product, critical theory. The term critical theory is something of a play on words. One is tempted to ask, what is the theory? The answer is, the theory is to criticize. Through unremitting, destructive criticism of every institution of Western society, they hope to bring that society down. Critical theory is the basis for gay studies, black studies, women's studies, and various other studies departments found on American university campuses today. These departments are the home base of political correctness. David Horowitz was present at the birth of campus political correctness. Well, I was, I was a radical in the 60s. I was a Marxist. Uh, and, uh, you know, my, my buddies were people like Tom Hayden. Um, I edited the largest magazine of the left at the time, uh, Ramparts. But the Frankfurt School was important in Marxism because they no longer believed really in the future. They only believed in, in destroying uh, capitalism and destroying, uh, you know, bourgeois democracy is what we would have called it. And if you look at today's campuses, that, that kind of nihilism is really the dominant theme. That is, attack America. The Frankfurt School was careful never to define what critical theory was for, only what it was against. Again, Martin Jay, the Frankfurt School's semi-official historian. The critical theory itself always felt reluctant uh, about being uh, put in the straitjacket of uh, systematization and uh, defied its reduction to a simple definition. Critical theory actually attempted to politicize logic itself. Horkheimer wrote, logic is not independent of content. That means an argument is logical if it helps destroy Western culture, illogical if it supports it. Such twisted thought lies at the heart of the political correctness now inculcated into American university students. When there's, uh, you know, 1% of the campus is conservative and the other 9% uh, and the other 9% of the people who care are incredibly liberal, you're going to get, uh, you, know, almost, you know, something approaching a socialist state. But how did the work of a small group of German Marxist intellectuals come to America? <laughs> In 1933, when the Nazis came to power in Germany, the Institute for Social Research fled. It fled to New York City, where it was re-established that same year with help from the president of Columbia University. Once in America, the Frankfurt School gradually shifted the focus of its work from destroying German society and culture to attacking the society and culture of its new place of refuge. Not only did they apply critical theory to American society, they added some new elements. One was the Institute's so-called Studies in Prejudice, which culminated in 1950 in Theodore Adorno's immensely influential book, The Authoritarian Personality. In it, Adorno argued that the American people possessed many fascist traits, and that anyone who supported traditional American culture was psychologically unbalanced. It is no accident that today, the politically correct are quick to label their opponents fascists and suggest that they need psychological treatment in the form of sensitivity training. People over profits! People over profits! People the Frankfurt School even integrated political correctness' most fashionable cause, environmentalism, into their cultural Marxism by way of Horkheimer and Adorno's book, Dialectic of Enlightenment. Well, they were very interested in what uh, was called the domination of nature. Uh, dialectic of enlightenment in particular moved the emphasis away from economic domination to the species domination of the natural world, including, we might say, internal nature through uh, psychoanalytic understanding of repression. So they were very keen on recognizing that we needed to have uh, a more nurturant uh, and a more, uh, let's say, a balanced relationship between humankind and the natural world. After World War II, Horkheimer and Adorno returned to Germany, where the Institute was re-established at Frankfurt University. But not all the old members of the Institute returned. Fatefully, Herbert Marcuse remained in America, eventually becoming a professor at Brandeis and University of California, San Diego. Marcuse labored to finish the intellectual work 
begun by Horkheimer, Adorno, and Fromm in the 1930s. Marcuse, on the other, on the other hand, remained in the United States and um, during the 50s and 60s developed some of their earlier ideas, uh, merging Freud and Marx, an interest in aesthetics, and interested in cultural, uh, uh, let's say, tendencies towards what he would call negation, uh, which were usable in a, a campaign to call into question the, uh, what uh, Antonio Gramsci would have called hegemony of uh, uh, capitalist uh, bourgeois culture. And Marcuse became, uh, of course, the so-called guru of the new left. It was Marcuse who finally answered the question posed by Horkheimer in the early 30s. Who could substitute for the working class as an agent of revolution? So you had to find some new constituency, uh, whether it was students or blacks or women or gays or whatever it was. And, and Marcuse had a fluid Marxism that fit into this. Martin Jake confirms the role of the Frankfurt School in creating the victim groups that constitute the politically correct coalition. Uh, but the working class wouldn't play the hegemonic role that traditional Marxism had expected from it. And so uh, students, uh, blacks, um, other minority groups, women, uh, and so forth were, uh, they hoped at least, uh, able to come together. Of critical importance for the injection of the Frankfurt School's work into the student rebellion of the 1960s was Marcuse's revival of Fromm's notion of sexual liberation. Marcuse, however, was the main conduit of ideas. But Marcuse had written one important work in the 1950s called Eros and Civilization, a work which attempted to rub Freud against the grain and come out with a radical, even utopian reading of psychoanalysis. And that, combined with Norman O. Brown's Life Against Death, had uh, a great impact on the counterculture and on uh, emphasizing a libidinal element. Marcuse's Eros and Civilization condemned all restrictions on sexual behavior, calling instead for polymorphous perversity. Instead, it argues that at certain early developmental levels of the human uh, psyche, uh, there was a potential for sexual expression, sexual pleasure, which had not yet been organized into the restricted uh, notions of uh, heterosexual uh, sexuality, and that these had some sort of capacity to be uh, reinvigorated. Polymorphous perversity helped open the door to aspects of political correctness, such as gay liberation. This is, this is his idea of what uh, uh, human society, a uh, good human society should be based on was a, a certain kind of polymorphous perversity and narcissism which uh, by liberating um, uh, non-procreative eros was his term, uh, we, we would uh, find great enlightenment and great happiness. This was the, supposed to be the key to utopia. David Horowitz ties eros and civilization directly into the 60s rebellion he was part of. Uh, Marxism is a, a bankrupt creed and was bankrupt in, in by the 50s or earlier. People understood it didn't, it didn't work. There was no working class that was going to make a revolution. Capitalism, people were happy with capitalism, basically because it makes, you know, it's spread more money to more people than any other system in history. So they tried to find other uh, sources of revolutionary uh, energy. And one was the idea of sexual repression on the 60s. I mean, it was a way of, and people always think up complicated theories to, you know, do what they want to do. People wanted to do a lot in the 60s, so. If Herbert Marcuse, you know, gave them the intellectual justification for having a lot of sex with a lot of people, uh, a lot of the time. That's what Eros and Civilization, that's the title of his famous book on it, is about. Marcuse is also the source of one of political correctness's most notable characteristics. It's total intolerance for any viewpoint but its own. Marcuse argued that our free American society was actually a deception, that its true tolerance is somehow repressive, while he argued for something called liberating tolerance. And what he meant by that was liberating toleration or liberating tolerance meant intolerance from ideas and movements from the right and tolerance for any ideas from the left. Uh, it's a, you know, a recipe for uh, repression. Even Martin Jay, a great admirer of the Frankfurt School, admits the totalitarian aspect of Marcuse. 
perhaps his most significant essay in terms of impact, the one we haven't even mentioned, an essay on repressive tolerance, uh, written in the late 60s, which argued that uh, because the um, tolerance of different beliefs produced no action at all, because every belief seemed to be equal to uh, all others, and uh, racist and uh, neo-fascist and militarist beliefs were given equal weight to those that were pacifist and emancipatory. Uh, this led ultimately to the uh, problems of uh, political correctness and incorrectness uh, in the 1980s. Uh, that is, if you had a strong notion of who was politically correct, you could then be intolerant of those who weren't. And sometimes this can be used as a license by people on the left to deny uh, free speech to people they disagreed with. Through these works, Marcuse became the main agent of transmission of the Frankfurt School's ideas. Marcuse was a tremendously important uh, influence on the thinking of uh, young people in those days. He was one of the the uh, spiritual fathers of the movement. And through Marcuse, the new left found the rest of the Frankfurt School. And then in the 1960s, they were rediscovered by students uh, who uh, looked back at the work they'd done and rediscovered a source of a non-traditional, non-communist Marxism, which they found as an inspiration for the uh, student movement in the 1960s. Jay pays Marcuse uh, the ultimate compliment as a revolutionary. He became a kind of celebrity. I mean, in Paris, there were banners that said Marx, Mao, and Marcuse. So he was, uh, you know, luckily because of the alliteration up there with a couple of uh, pretty heavy hitters. And the consequences of the Frankfurt School's work now engulf us all. Martin Jay pays them due credit. Well, it's fascinating. If you compare them with other figures from the so-called Western Marxist tradition, they are perhaps more alive than virtually anybody else. Roger Kimball, although coming from the opposite political perspective from Martin Jay, agrees. The institution of um, the ideas of radical multiculturalism in the academy and uh, what you might call its enforcement wing, namely the ideology of political correctness, uh, testify to the uh, um, vitality uh, of some of those ideas, some of the ideas of the Frankfurt School. We asked former New Left leader David Horowitz what the members of the Frankfurt School, Horkheimer, Adorno, Marcuse, might think if they could come back and visit one of America's politically correct campuses today. Well, I, I'm sure they would be thrilled because they would be, you know, gods.